Welcome to another special edition episode of Last Week in Quantum. This is the show where we review the top news in the world of quantum computing and its impacts on the world of cybersecurity, AI, and more. I'm your host, Rebecca Crothmer, Founder and Chief Product Officer at QSecure. And today we have an expert in the field of AI, Pat Bowden. Pat is the global AI architect for Cisco, as well as a best-selling author. Drawing from his vast experience in engineering, development, and founding multinational companies, Pat is a force to be reckoned with in the world of AI. Pat's work focuses on the transformative power of AI, unlocking the true potential of data. Today, we'll be covering his article, The Journey, Quantum's Yellow Brick Road, where he talks about converging forces of quantum and gen AI, and of course, the importance of quantum safe cryptography to support trustworthy AI. Pat, great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me today. Yeah, thank you, Pat. And uh, one of my absolute favorite things about Pat is that he is a technology translator. And whenever there's emerging technology, there can be so much jargon um, that, that kind of alienate a lot of the, the, the general population. And Pat I think his superpower is translating advanced technology in, into stories and into ways that, that everyone can understand. Uh, and he's done that yet again in his latest blog post. And, and Pat's been uh, writing these, these blog posts for Cisco. And I think they're some of the most read blog posts that Cisco puts out. And most recently, you put out the, um, the, the blog post about Gen AI and, of course, PQC, post-quantum cryptography. And I really loved this post because um, it not only explains concepts and use cases in Gen AI that, that people can really connect to, um, it also really well explains how to use PQC to, um, to build trust in Gen AI. Because I think, as you've said, that's something that we really need to address is, is, uh, is people don't trust it. And we need to build that trust around it. So um, first of all, tell everybody a little bit about this post. Yeah, sure. Hey, so uh, you know, I've been in the business world for a very long time. One of the things I really like to do to be able to influence other human beings is to be able to tell stories. Stories, people can connect emotionally to storytelling and it allows them to understand things that maybe they would have been outside of their reach prior to that. So what I was doing with this particular story, my focus at Cisco is generative AI. And I, and I write on that topic and I talk on it and I do keynotes on that topic. So uh, this is something that's dear to me. On Gen AI, it's, it, the, the large language models that are out there today are not trustworthy on their own. And so what I've, I've, I've done in multiple stories about how do we connect and actually make these uh, Gen AI um, architectures uh, trustworthy. And so this story that I told in this about QQC and Gen AI was to set up in a use case, uh, which is based on medical science, uh, with gener generative AI to be able to find new drug discoveries and be able to do interesting things that impact human beings in a healthy way. And by, by the way, be able to do that in a trusting way by using po post-quantum cryptography. And so that's what I set up. So I always, when I do a story, I set up a story that's interesting and, and, and it allows people to understand at uh, a human level what I'm more trying to achieve. And then I always use a use case. One of the challenges we have in the Web3 space and in quantum and in, in Gen AI, it's a lot of times people forget the use cases really are the things that matter the most. So I set up a use case and I always talk about the benefits of the use cases, the challenges of the use cases. And I also talk about the old, ultimately, what, what do we achieve by doing this? Because people are making investments right now in Gen AI. And a lot of times they don't know what they're investing in. So what I'm trying to do is give them an understanding of that and do it in the storytelling format. The good news, guys, is everybody... Most people can read that article in about four minutes, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to keep it to about 950 words and then about four minutes uh, for most people to be able to read. So it's very accessible to all human beings. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I love the article. Um, and one of my favorite parts is kind of when you talk about collaboration. Uh, so using Gen AI to, to come up with these these new um, ways to develop advanced, advanced medications or um, whatever it might be, drug discovery. And, uh, and you talk about collaboration and how it, it, it can be dangerous in a, uh, a world where cybersecurity is very important to share and exchange findings, research uh, with collaborators, whether it be other universities, um, 
research locations in other countries and using post quantum cryptography to secure those transmissions and know that that people are not going to intercept those and be able to uh, ultimately decode those. So I love I also love that concept of collaboration. Um, it's always what and I think Rebecca in that in speaking to the collaboration, it's always part of my work because people don't uh, don't create and create inventions in a vacuum. They do with a collaborative effort of other human beings. So it's really critical to me is how do we safeguard from you know bad nation actors or bad actors? How do we safeguard our assets and the things we create as a collaborative unit? And I think that's really important that we protect that safe space for um, people to collaborate. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I was going to say, I think is so much of the work that you do is translating for people to come into the conversation and that collaboration piece. So, so critical. And that's why we're, we're doing last week in quantum too, to, to bring more people into the quantum conversation. Um, you, tell us a little bit, cause you're, I mean, you're, you're kind of the guy uh, leading a lot of the charge at Cisco in AI and gen AI. Um, and Cisco is, as we all know, is really the, and the backbone, the foundation of, of how we communicate over distances, um, which enables collaboration uh, in a way that, that we never had access to prior to this era of connectivity. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about your, your work at Cisco. So at Cisco, what we're doing is we're doing generative AI. We've been doing artificial intelligence and machine learning for decades. Uh, so that's not new to us, but what's new to everyone is generative AI. So the ability to take our this and be able to do natural language, be able to communicate to our um, systems, be able to find out information we couldn't easily find out prior to this to, to today. So one of the things we break the Cisco into with AI is we talk about um, AI on Cisco, which is on our infrastructure. So you have an AI application that you're running and you want to put it on our infrastructure, well, well known in the networking space, security space and compute space. So we're doing that. And especially with the acquisition of uh, Splunk that just happened last month. So there's going to be a lot more of that going forward. AI in Cisco. So this is inside our products. We're going to be able to actually deploy, whether it's networking or uh, security or any of the other tooling that we have observability, where I actually have AI assistants that are actually inside our products, which allow our customers to be able to utilize our products more, you know, more easily, make a lot of interesting data accessible to regular human beings. Yet again, what we're trying to achieve. The last one is really about the use cases. And it's really AI at Cisco. How are we using AI in a way that's actually propelling us to do things that are game changing? And so I'm, I'm deeply involved in that with Cisco. But that's kind of how we break down the world, Rebecca, if that makes sense. So it's AI in, yes. AI on, and AI at Cisco. Ah, okay. Very nice. Um, yeah, and, and I know you are a fellow uh, AI ethics nerd, uh, AI safety nerd, um, and shout out, I would love for everyone to walk away today with that idea that if, um, if you care about uh, trust in AI, that collaboration is very important, the translation is very important, take, take, Pat's, uh, take Pat's lead there. But what are your current sort of thoughts around, around AI safety? I think it's really critical that we that we as a community understand that there are challenges in AI. The, gener the large language models that have been created by the large providers are not trustworthy unto themselves. So we need to understand that. And so they're not just trust untrustworthy, they're also biased and a lot of other things because they're a representation of human beings and we are all those things. And so at the end of the day, we have to take that with a grain of salt. And when we get data from an AI, we need to realize that we need to be able to have a way to make that adversarial. And one of the things I've done uh, in the modeling I've been doing is what's really effective, probably the most effective thing I've done. If you were extracting large data from these big data lakes called OpenAI, and you want to be able to validate and make sure the data is correct, the easiest way to do that is make another large language model an adversary of the primary one. So in my world, I take OpenAI, extract data through the probability engine. Then I use other ones like Google Gemini to actually validate and actually be an adversary to the other LLM. When you do that, you actually get a lot more trusted data. And so I found, mm -hmm. I, found the, I found my numbers go up incredibly high. And if you're trying to do a large extraction of data, that's really the only way you could do it. So that's one of the things I've found. And, and so as you guys experiment, let me know. But the, if you're trying to do large extraction from large data lakes, you know, kind of like OpenAI, you need to be able to have a way to actually validate that data. Hmm. That's very cool. I, it's almost it's almost very human-like because I think we uh, we... We're, we're social animals. We take, we learn things from other people. 
other people keep us in check. We keep other people in check and, and we want everybody to succeed. And so that's kind of, I like that it's exactly in a, in a what sense, that's, that's exactly a human. What it is, Rebecca. So it is, it is a yeah. way, remember these are representations of us. So how do we actually validate ourselves? If we're, if we're smart, we have people that we know or trust or trusted resources that actually validate our data and says, keeps us in check. Cause we can all, we can all, we all can be flawed. We can all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's great to have somebody there that's actually going to support you and be able to say, you know what, you're you're right about this, but you know on this thing, I think you I think you may have strayed. It's that's exactly right. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that leveraging models to to improve other other models, just like uh, just like humans, we need each other. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, and you know, to to bring it back around to quantum, since this is last week in quantum, um, I, I got into quantum from AI because we have this really fantastic opportunity to set the foundations of the quantum computing ecosystem to be very um, pro, uh, you know, quantum enhanced AI, pro safety, pro ethics. Um, and so, of course, quantum is going to unlock so many doors in, uh, in what we think of as AI. So going forward, uh, it's a very exciting time. Uh, and, you know, fi final question. When it comes to AI, what's what's one thing that you would like everybody in the audience today to know? Well, AI is not one thing. It's much larger than that. It's, it's like saying, you know, we have so many people say AI and they can make it sound like it's security or something, right? The reality is it's mm -hmm. like saying technology. And so the challenge for you, you got to expose your mind. You have to blow it up in a much bigger way. One of the, by the way, as you think about that and you think about these complex topics, Here's one call to action I would have for the, the audience of this group today, whether it's quantum or whatever other technology. If you have converged technologies that are occurring at each other, whether it's um, uh, confidence computing and uh, Gen AI or it's PQC and Gen AI, uh, think about how we communicate that to your mom or your grandma. How do we communicate in a way that's going to be impactful? If anybody in the, uh, that listens to this has a, a topic that they're interested in, I'd be happy to work with you to be able to create a story that actually is meaningful and impactful about that subject and allows that to be accessible by regular human beings. Love it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Pat. Thank you for the work that you do to, to translate and bring everybody into the conversation. Final plug for Pat, check out his book. He's a best-selling author. And with that, thank you. And join us next week on Last Week in Quantum. Thanks, Rebecca.